This podcast show is brought to you by Northern Bee Books, publishers of new and second-hand bee books. Founded in 1976, Northern Bee Books claim to stock the largest collection of new and old bee books in the English-speaking world. They also publish the Beekeepers Quarterly and Natural Bee Husbandry magazines. Visit northernbeebooks.co.uk to view their book list. Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Bay. This is episode 149 of our beekeeping show. This is our Q&A. Yes, and so in this show we've received questions about climate change, wax moth and swarm preventing and finding that elusive queen. She's always hiding somewhere, isn't she? Yeah, but she should be there. She's there somewhere. Somewhere. We are Gary. And Margaret. We are Kiwi Mana. And Kiwi Mana are beekeepers from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges on the wild west coast of Auckland in the North Island of New Zealand. Yes, we build and sell beekeeping equipment and bees provide beekeeper services and education. Yes, and every new subscriber that joins our free beekeeping newsletter, the greatest newsletter in the world, absolutely, is asked, what's your biggest beekeeping problem? And in this show, we endeavour to answer some of your burning questions. Yeah, those kind of questions that are buzzing around in your head. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, these are beekeeping burning questions. If there are other burning questions, you should ask your doctor. Well, well said, Gary. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> We appreciate that you've taken time to come and join us and have a listen and see what you think about our answers. Yes, and this show has been made with the help of our supporters. And the show notes page for this are kiwi.bz slash 149. Let's go, Gary. Okay, the next question is from Benedict Hughes, and it's about climate change. Climate change is affecting flowering times and amounts of nectar. What can he do? Join Greenpeace? Um, Plant more trees? Don't burn down forests? Well, that's that's not a stupid idea. You could plant trees that flower at different times, and, you know, every, every season's different these days, Benedict. So it's just, uh, unfortunately, it's the new truth, isn't it? I think that it's a really good uh, question that he's made because it's true that climate change is making the seasons a bit unpredictable. We've got a general rule, okay? The 1st of September is generally spring for us here in New Zealand. We're six weeks before that. We're already planning what we're going to do. If the season's late, then we're on to it, you know. But if we're late, we're going to be, you know, in a heap of trouble. And so I think that when you look at climate, you've also got to assess your local area as well. So if there's certain things happening in your area, be aware of that and try to be prepared. If you are experiencing certain things, try and do the best things you can to avoid the issues. Like if it's drought, make sure they've got some water. Make sure you can you know, help them with that. If there's no plants and stuff around, then maybe you could encourage your local council to start putting some plants in areas near where you are. So just maybe thinking a bit more outside your own bee yard and see if councils can do some plantings that would help and use plants that flower at different times of the year. And maybe ones that, yeah, don't need as much water. When it's a drought, it's hard, eh? Because none of the plants are producing nectar because they they're trying to they're just trying to survive, aren't they themselves? I think so. And and I personally, if it was a really drought a season, I wouldn't be taking any honey off. I would think that you're just probably going to kill your bees if you take honey off. So if you're in it for the honey, then maybe you need to move to an area where you could you know, that removing honey won't be a problem. But drought is a very scary thing. So I feel for those who suffer from this. But, yeah, maybe there's some things that can be done through local councils, get some more plantings done across the seasons. Yeah, it it is a concern. It's a big dilemma. And unfortunately, we we wouldn't have enough time to give you all the answers because we don't really have them, do we, (laughs) about climate change? 
No, I think that we're finding the same. So we just have to modify our behaviours and, you know, that's why we always leave our girls with a box of 10 to 12 honey frames because we don't know how long the rain is going to last and they will want to feed, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thanks, Benedict, for that question. Okay, the next question is about wax moss from Joseph Lamaster. Yeah, he's got wax moss in one of his seven hives and it's taken over. He believes the bees left first. I think you're right. Yeah, you're right. They did. Because the thing about wax moths is they, they're, the, they're nature's cleanup crew and they'll go in and, and eat all the old wax from, a, from an AFB infected hive or any hive and they'll clean it all up. So you generally, the best cure for wax moths is a strong hive. Well said, Gary, and I concur. And this problem would have been occurring probably about six or seven weeks before the wax moth actually came in. So. If you are managing beehives, you need to inspect them regularly, particularly if you are in a country that has the Varroa destructor mite, because if the bees start to get sick, there will be symptoms before the bees leave. So if the bees absconded, there was a threat in that hive already. And so once they, the bees are gone, yes, the wax moth also love pollen. They love going and hiding underneath all the pollen, and sometimes you can't always see it. Yeah, and the other thing I'd say is that if the hive population is diminishing because you're moving into winter, you need to reduce the amount of boxes and frames you have in the hive. Well, not frames, but the boxes. So you reduce them down so that the the cluster of the bees is big enough to protect all the areas so you won't get hive wax moths sneaking in the corner. Yeah, I think that's right. Space management is key when you are looking at, and I don't know what time of the year this has happened, but the assumption it could be in autumn, and in autumn, yes, that is a crucial time. You need to make sure all your treatments are being done. If you're using oxalic acid vaporization, you need to regularly check and monitor any organic treatments you should be monitoring. So in my view, this has probably been the result of Varroa and then the hive is weakened and they may have absconded or they have died from virus-related things or they've got sack brood and the hive has just died away. And yeah, as Gary said, the clean-up crews come in taking up. advantage. <laughs> That's right. It's not the wax moss problem. It's, it's the bees have left and left it unprotected. And say that sentence again that you said before, Gary, in a nutshell. Best way to cure wax moths is to have a strong hive. Well done. Thanks, Jophus, for your question. And let's move on. Okay, the next question is from David. And he says, swarm prevention. How do I prevent my bees from swarming? Oh, lots of ideas here. Okay, David, well... Yes, swarm prevention. So prevention means that you want to be ahead of the game. So you want to prevent them from leaving. So there are ways that commercial guys deal with this. They will come into spring or the end of winter and they will um, start preparing by feeding. And that is generally the time when they are preparing their hives for the new season. And spring is the time when populations build up and that's when they are looking to spread their genetics if they're strong colonies, so they are likely to swarm. So the way that we do it at our apiary is that we do what we call preemptive splitting So as soon as the conditions are right, the temperatures are going up, there's drones present, we will go in and check how many frames of brood there are. And if there's about eight or nine frames of brood, we will do what we call a preemptive artificial split or artificial swarm um, method. And then we will save our old queen 
and we will let the colony, when it's split, we move the old queen away. She thinks she's swarmed. And then the remaining um, position will have the hive where they'll raise a new queen. Commercial guys kill their queens in spring and put new queens in because that's how I understand that they use it to control swarming. Oh, and they also, sometimes they do it in autumn as well, don't they? Or as well as, not as well, but in autumn rather than spring. Okay, um, that doesn't sound a very good idea for me because I think a colony should really be very ensconced. I think they should have a good solid queen there and I think removing a queen in autumn is really silly. Okay. And the other thing is is that just remember that swarming is different from absconding. Swarming indications are when there is drones, lots of drones present The hive is getting really full, so you have to worry about space management and and adding new boxes. And then swarm cells are very pronounced and usually at the bottom of the frame, and they will be indicative of the desire for that colony to swarm. So we try not to get let our hives get to that stage. Yeah, I mean, t- to be honest, swarming a swarming hive is, means you're doing something right, doesn't it? Oh, it means you've got a wonderful <laughs> hive. They're really strong. Yeah, it means it's really strong. Yeah, absconding hives usually happen in autumn or in, you know, end of summer if the hive is, you know, honey-bound or they're really sick with varroa. So the bees just leave. They don't leave a queen cell or anything in there. They just go. There's no eggs, nothing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's there's a really good article on, there on the Kiwi Mana website about how to split a hive. So, I'd, I'd get that and follow it through. And I'll put a link in the show notes. And the show notes for this one will be kiwi.bz slash 149. So, have a look there and you can see the article about splitting hives. And I think the bottom line is with this one is that it's all about preparation and you should be doing it eight weeks before you hit spring. Okay, the next question is from Denny. Finding the queen. Finding the queen in so many bees and making splits. Well, the splits we talked about in the previous question, so you can look into that. But finding the queen, that oh, it is hard, eh? This is what I do, right? Yeah. After I've opened the hive and I've decided, okay, Well, I decide before I go and do the inspection why I'm inspecting. So if I'm checking brood and I want to check what's going on in the brood area, I will go straight down to the brood box. I always will take out the first frame and I will hang it on my frame holder. And what happens when you do that is that you know that there's nothing on that frame in terms of a queen because there's no brood on it. But check it anyway. And then the thing is that when you're a learner beekeeper, often you do it so quickly. And even if the hive is really full, you should be able to find the queen. Okay, so some people mark the queen, which makes it a bit easier. And then others just, I will just, you know, ask the bees very nicely if we could please see Queenie today. And does that work? Yep. (laughs) Okay. Well, the the other tip I've got is that if if you find the frame of the eggs where it's got eggs on it, new brand new fresh eggs, she's generally going to be there or the next frame over, eh? Yeah, I think that's true because if the eggs are that new, like if they're standing up in the cell, then that indicates she has just been laying. So yeah. But try not to shake all the bees off or anything. Just quietly look. Try not to hurry, try not to rush, just be calm and quietly look through. When I use my frame holder, that just helps that space thing so you're not panicking because if you panic, then you will miss her. But I think as soon as you've been doing it and you've been looking for your queen and you see her, yeah, you'll be on the right track and you'll see her again and again. But it's just that first thing, getting your eyes used to seeing the queen. And, and the other thing is she always moves differently, doesn't she? The queen, she sort of she moves differently to worker bees. I don't know, after a while you, you sort of 
get really good at it, eh? The thing that I find with queens is that because their abdomen is so long and it's usually very heavy when they, because they're fully mated and they're quite heavy in the abdomen area, they can walk a little slower. Yeah, and I've just got a book called Queen Spotting by Hillary, Hillary Kearney, and that's fantastic. Eh? And there's lots of practice frames of bees on these. You can practice in a book, which is much easier than out in the field, isn't it? Oh, yeah, and guess what, Gary? I'm just the superstar. You are the superstar. But I think, really, it's, it's about experience and doing it for a long time. My eyes can just, oh, there she is. Oh, yeah. There she is. But then there's some colonies that seriously... Those queens are like, is there a queen here? <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them, some queens hate the light and they're constantly trying to run away from it, don't they? Yeah, so don't take, don't be offended by it. Get it? Don't be offended by it. But if you follow our our, our splitting method, the, the, you don't really need to find the queen, do you? Yeah, because that method involves brushing the bees off each frame and putting them into the first box. So you can effectively do it by using the brushing off the bees I personally don't do that I personally locate the queen myself but the brushing method in that split is a way to do it just be very gentle with that brushing off you don't want to really shake the queen off a frame if you can help it because you know you might get damaged or fall on the ground or anything like that so yeah, but I think the thing is is that you can also use the smoker to bring the bees down. Mm. So that, you know, just go really quietly, one frame at a time. Just take your time and do it on a really nice warm day where it's going to be, you know, okay for the hive to be open and just quietly go through it and do that. But if you do an assessment a couple of weeks before, is a good idea just to do a practice run on looking at frames. Yep, absolutely. And the other the other thing you can do is one trick I heard is if you've got if you've got more than one hive, you can get a frame of eggs from another hive as long as it's disease free and put it in the, the hive you can't find the queen. Leave it like five minutes and she'll come down to that frame because she can smell the other queen. That works, doesn't it? Ah, uh, that sounds really risky to me. Yeah, it can be, especially if you're not sure what disease looks like. <laughs> Indeed. So, but that's your last I, resort. Yeah. A few ideas there, Denny, but I think that method will give you some some good ideas and I would suggest that do a practice run, you know, a couple of weeks before, just also so you can assess how the hive is going before you go and do the split. Absolutely. Thanks, Denny, and thanks everyone else. <laughs> Well, there's our ideas. We hope you enjoyed this Q&A show. If you've got a better answer, please leave a comment on the show notes. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks, a new show for you. If you can add to the conversation, please comment below. Have a question? Hit that Tell Us button. Yeah, that means you can be part of the next show. And yeah, maybe you've got some question that's been buzzing around in your head. (laughs) And maybe we'll have the answer. Maybe. Thanks for listening to our show and thanks to all our supporters who support us through the Patreon service. This week we would like to thank Nathan Buzzinger Beekeeping from Buzzinger Beekeeping Trish Stretton Greg Parr from Parr's Products Christopher Brown Sana Wynne-Lewis Lisa Morrissey Thanks guys. Thank you so much. You guys just help us to keep motivated and love you very much. If you love what we do and find it useful, you can support us too. Visit kiwi.bz slash banana. Yes, and the show notes for this podcast are kiwi.bz slash 149. Thanks for joining us this week. It's been awesome. Yeah, thanks everyone and for all those questions and and sending them in and becoming part of our newsletter and we're just so happy that you are part of all this. So thanks guys. See you next time. See ya. Oh, cup of tea time. Yeah, it's time for that kettle to get on the boil. See you guys.